This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we are now ready to go. Uh, our esteemed online viewers and listeners, uh, both here in Kenya and, and, and abroad, uh, those of us who are here uh, this afternoon on site, uh, our guests, uh, you know, uh, Professor Macharia, uh, my friend, uh, uh, once here, Costa over there, and, and, and many others. Uh, Professor Macharia Munene, uh, who will be the discussant of this session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, uh, those who are here in Nairobi. Uh, good afternoon, our colleagues uh, in America and Europe. I saw a few people from the US, although it's very, actually it's morning there. Uh, good morning, those who are listening and watching us uh, from Europe and America. And uh, good evening, those who are in Asia. Uh, I saw a colleague and good friend from South Korea online. Uh, friends, my, my name is Kenneth uh, Ombongi. I'm the current chair of the Department of History and Archaeology here in the University of Nairobi. And um, it is my pleasure, uh, you know, and of course, a singular honor uh, to welcome all of you to our ongoing seminar series, which we have uh, themed bringing down history and archaeology from the ivory tower. Now, the single most important and overall goal of this series is uh, to bring history and archaeology to the public, to deliberately move away from the conventional and the esoteric approach to and the audiences of historical and archaeological scholarship. Uh, literally, as a friend of mine and the former student, Dr. Nicholas uh, Gizuku from New York put it river, quote, close. This that, that and this is and has been possible thanks to uh, technology. I've, I've even seen people from my own village actually online, a uh, classmate of mine who is a teacher in some place uh, in the countryside uh, online uh, listening to us. Now, our speaker today is uh, David M. Anderson, a professor of African history, University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. Professor Anderson uh, is going to speak to us on a topic he has entitled Koitalel's Kin, Identity, Autochtony, and the Occult in Kenya's Western Highlands. Uh, Professor Anderson, Karibu Nyumbani. Uh, I'm saying Karibu uh, Nyumbani, which is Swahili for welcome home. Welcome home uh, because uh, David uh, is not new to our department. He was at some point a research associate here and has um, persistently kept contact with us uh, and regularly so. Uh, Professor Anderson holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and I guess uh, uh, his uh, supervisor, his PhD supervisor, John Lonsdale, told me he will log in. I, I hope he will be able to, to come in from Trinity, uh, Cambridge. Um, uh, before uh, Warwick, uh, Professor Anderson uh, uh, taught at the University of Oxford. And I'm sure many of us uh, probably, except those uh, uh, who are joining us for the first time, uh, know that his research interests have been uh, uh, mainly on the history of colonial counterinsurgency in uh, in in Kenya, and um, one of the very uh, one of the very celebrated publications of his is actually histories of the hanged, a very incisive historical analysis of the unprecedented violence and atrocities that characterize the Mau Mau movement, both from the British authorities and also from the African insurgents. Now, in the current presentation, uh, Professor Anderson will focus on uh, Koitarel Arab Samoei, the Nandi 
or coyot or occult uh, leader who led his people in their fight against the British uh, colonial conquest only uh, to be treacherously shot by a British soldier while under flag of truce. Samoe stands out among the Bathyon of Kenya's heroes of early colonial resistance and his influence uh, through his kin, the current uh, Orkoik among the Kalenjins has stood actually the test of time. Anderson in this presentation argues that the wider history of the Orkoik remains a Kalenjin concern that is not much understood beyond Kenya's Western highlands. In this presentation, he proposes to highlight significant themes in that history, positioning it at the center of Kenya's colonial and post-colonial experience. For us uh, friends here in the department, I, I think there is no better way for the Department of History and Archaeology, University of Nairobi, to celebrate the impending uh, visit of His Majesty, the King Charles III, uh, the British monarch to Kenya, uh, than to delve into a, such a theme of our shared past and uh, the continuing polemics on how to deal with our long drawn history of violence and uh, uh, trickery. I think without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure and indeed singular honor on behalf of my colleagues in the Department of History and Archaeology to welcome Professor David Anderson to speak to us. Welcome, Prof. Thank you very much, Kenneth, for a, a wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be back here. First time I've been in this, what I still think of as a new building. Uh, in my day, we had seminars in a very small room over in the old Mapahan Gandhi building. So it's very nice to be here. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm talking today about research that I began in the 1980s. And it was in fact a project that I was working on to research a wider history of the Western Highlands. At the time that we, or I, I discovered the trial papers in the National Archives relating to the Mau Mau trials in the 1950s. Having found those trial papers, I became distracted and I started focusing on that project and I left this one behind. So it's taken me 25 years and more to get back to it, but I finally returned to this project. At the first stage of work on it, I completed a couple of articles uh, and I had plans to write a full book. So what I'm gonna subject you to whether it's a pleasure or not, we remain to be seen. But I'm going to subject you to an outline of that book, of the things I plan to put in the book. So I'm using you as my guinea pigs to find out if you can survive this story. And I think it's quite appropriate that the story is in the series that's about coming down from the ivory tower, showing perhaps how history can relate to the real world and the present. Because as at the end of the talk, I, I, I will range through many arcane things but I will also at the end come back to contemporary Kenya and I will show an image of your current president involved with Orkoyot. I will show an image of your past president involved with Orkoyot. And I will talk about the legal case that's currently going on concerning the Talai clan in the Western Highlands that may yet compel King Charles to apologize for more than Mau Mau violence. There may be other things that he will end up apologizing for as well. But we'll come to that later. So let me begin. Next slide, please. So I, in each slide, I've, I've tried to use historical images to illustrate what I'm saying. And so I'll, I'll partly explain the images. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about the 19th century origins of archaic power and authority, where, where the story begins, I suppose. Quite hard to illustrate that with a photograph. So the best I could do was to find some images from 1900, almost in the 19th century. Uh, and these are photographs taken at Baringo of the El Chamus people as they are about to set out on a what's called a, a punitive expedition 
on behalf of British colonialists. They're going to raid a neighboring group. And here they are arrayed in their finery and their armaments. And uh, in the top picture, they're, they're rehearsing skirmishing by charging at each other in the manner of a 19th century East African battle. So this photograph is as close as I think you can get to imagining how one of the battles in the Eloquot Wars, for example, in the 19th century might have taken place, what it might have looked like. But we can't be sure as historians, we're just guessing, but probably as close as we get. And the shield patterns on the lower images of this community are interesting also, because Chamus was made up of two different groups of people, in fact, more than two. And those groups included um, refugees from the Eloy Cop Wars of the 19th century, who were dispersed and defeated and who resettled at Baringo, where they were then attacked again by other Maasai groups. And we can see in the shield patterns, the identities of different sections in the patterning of the shields. So we can understand this, this, this photograph is made up of some people who were in that category, others who are not. So this is a very mixed community, but it reflects the dispersal and assimilation of those wars. So the reason for choosing those images then is that the origins of the story about the, the Talai and Orkoyik among the Kalenjin begins in the Maasai Eloikop Wars. So one has to go back to the 1840s and 1850s and the origins of those wars to understand this story. Now the Oikop Wars, uh, many people in this room will, will know, but for those who may not be familiar with 19th century history, uh, came about among Ma-speaking peoples in the mid 19th century, in the wake of the great drought of the early 19th century. So broadly speaking, between 1780 and the 1820s, all of central and northern Kenya and all of the Rift Valley down through into Tanzania suffered what is called a mega drought. They went for more than 30 years without rain. And we know this because of the paleoecological record, and it's now quite well documented that this was a vast and substantial drought. And that many of the stories of origins and of movements of peoples that we gathered as oral histories 50, 60, 70 years ago, those stories told the tales of what happened during this drought. But only in recent years have we begun to understand the full significance of that. Now, the Maasai groups that were fighting against each other, again, we have to be honest, we're not entirely sure why they were fighting. We think they're fighting over resources, over pasture, water, salt, and access to and control of the resources. We do know that these wars become very violent. We know that groups of Maasai sections combine together to attack other groups and that some groups completely disappear during these wars. They are destroyed and they are assimilated by, by the victors. Now in that process, ritual leaders played a significant role. So among the, among the Maasai speakers in the 19th century, the warrior groups who fought in these wars were organized and managed by the Bonok, the Libons of the Maasai. Now, when a, a one section was defeated or dispersed, the Libons of that section fled. And what happens here is that several groups of Loibon flee and seek refuge among Kalenjin speakers in the Western Highlands. They go to neighboring peoples. And there they join existing occult practitioners. So these Kalenjin groups already have their own practitioners of the magical arts. And the Loboinok join those and become assimilated with them. We know this because clan histories collected in the early 20th century 
recount this in quite a lot of detail and uh, giving several different versions of it according to different clans and different locations. So the Algeo versions are a little different than the Nandi ones, the Nandi ones are a little different than the Kipsigis ones and so on. So we're able to look at these sources quite dispassionately. And we don't have to depend on any one author or any one source. We can compare and contrast. So these first stories, these are quite useful things. We can use the evidence and weigh it. And from this, we get a good sense that there are at least three different stories or different histories of how the Talai clan emerges. So what we are told among Nandi is that all of these practitioners belong to one clan and that that clan is kept separate from other clans for reasons of pollution and of contamination. So these people in the Talai clan are, are, in some ways, they are others. They're not like everyone normally. They are not ordinary people. They are people who have powers. So what are those powers? Well, among Kalenjin, many of you will know there are many different occult practitioners, but most of them use what we call powers of the hands. They manipulate things to give readings. So maybe they read the entrails of a, of, of, of a goat or a, or a sheep or a cow. Maybe they toss sandals. Maybe they see the future in the embers of the fire. There are many different ways practitioners predict and foretell. But those are all considered powers that involve manipulating something. The Okoyek were different because their powers taken from the Libanok, the Maasai Libon, were powers of foresight. They were not powers of the hands, they were powers of the head. They could see the future. They could see beyond the horizon. They could tell you what was going to happen. So these powers of the head are different. They're distinctive and they're recognized as being distinctive. Now, among Talai, not all children will be endowed with these powers. Interestingly, the powers are said to come through the female line, but they invest male children. An interesting mixture of matriarchy and patriarchy. And not all male children will have the greatest powers. So some members of the Talai clan are not practitioners of occult arts at all but others are. And in the early 20th century, the European commentators who, who, who encountered these people imagined for themselves that somehow only the cleverest boys were invested with these powers because to do what the Talai did, you needed intelligence. You needed to be smart and clever. And maybe there's something in that assumption. So these people are not... Um, they're not witches. Some European observers thought they were to do with witchcraft. They're nothing to do with witchcraft. But they can curse you. They can give you the evil eye. And among Kalenjin communities, certainly in the first half of the 20th century, you didn't really want to have too much to do with it alive if you could avoid it. This was a slightly risky business. You might go for advice if you really needed it, but otherwise, oh, maybe you stay your distance. And you certainly don't want to lie marrying your daughters. That's not something that's going to happen because that, that will not be good for you. So they are kept at one distance. They are ki kind of not quite clean. Yeah. But some to lie were very omnipotent and very forceful and even coercive. And among Kipsigis and Nandi communities in particular, there are stories of Orkoyik taking women, taking children. In other words, seizing what it is they want rather than simply asking for it. So what I'm trying to portray here is that between Talai and the wider community, there is tension. The Talai are there, they're significant, and they have a ritual role I'll come to in a moment that's very important but they are not necessarily people you want as your neighbors. So they often tend to live in rather remote areas, a little distant from everyone else. But their authority in terms of the communities really revolves around generational transition. These challenging speaking groups 
have edge set systems, and those edge sets require transitions of the various age grades as they progress. And those transitions are presided over by the orchoic, just as in the Maasai case, the senior loibons preside over Maasai transitions. Now, we don't know if members of the Talai clan in Nandi or Kipsigis did this before the Olocot Wars, but we maybe suspect that perhaps they didn't. This may be an innovation brought in with the assimilation of the Boynok elements from the Maasai culture. So what we have here, in other words, is something that is ostensibly Kalenjin, but has a very strong Maasai origin, and that its practices appear to marry elements of Maasai and Kalenjin practice. So it's quite hard to say what the Okoyik are. They, they defy easy description. But their role as ritual authority over generational transitions is crucial because as with the, with the Loibons of the Maasai, they therefore have great control over and great relationships with the warrior age sets, the younger men. And typically, those relationships are built up through Leboinok or um, Okoyik giving blessings to warriors before they go on raids, before they go to acquire cattle or to raid neighboring peoples. And that relationship gives the Okoyuk who want this relationship an element of control over warfare and conflict. Now, in the Oloikot Wars, that was very important, but there can only be some victors and many who were defeated. The defeated end up, I think, as the Okoyuk. Now, we begin to hear about these in the historical written records only with the advent of European penetration of this area in the late 19th century. So in telling the story of the Okoyik from around the late 1880s, we become more and more dependent on European colonial sources. These are not without their problems because European observers maybe did not always understand what it was they were seeing and they maybe didn't always understand how to explain it. So I think we have to treat these sources quite critically and with a great deal of caution. But the oral histories also give us a lot of information about these guys. Because they were also, they were seers, they were also prophets. They prophesied the future. And in Nandi and Kipsigi's traditions, and indeed in Algeo and Pakot traditions, these actors are inscribed with supernatural powers that allow them to prophesy what will happen. So prophecies become linked to particular Okoyik. They are remembered, and Okoyot is remembered for having made a prophecy. So for example, the Okoyik Kimnyole among the Nandi in the late 1880s, very early 1890s, is said to have prophesied the coming of the white man. He is said to have given a long prophecy which described a serpent, an iron serpent, coming through the land and devouring Nandi. And he describes it even passing through the valley below Nandi, which is exactly what the railway did eventually. And he describes the white giants who will come with it. So Kimyoli is credited with prophesying what would happen. But of course, we don't know that Kimyoli actually said any of this. And in most cases, we know from study of prophecies in other cultures elsewhere, including in biblical cultures in the Christian tradition, we know that really what people do is they put words in prophets' mouths. In other words, often the prophet is attributed with what they are saying long after their death. And given that Kimyoli was stoned to death by the Nandi in 1889, after a particularly severe drought in which he failed to prophesy the outcomes. Uh, we can't be certain that this prophecy attributed to Kimnoli was actually his. It may have been someone else's, it may not have been said at all. So what I'm trying to get across is the idea that prophecy is a very flexible tool 
that can be used to inscribe power and authority onto these people, yet we shouldn't take it too literally. And I and certainly in my in collecting all, all histories around this, I, I don't think the people I've spoken to in the Western Highlands take it too seriously either. They understand there is an, a dev an element of manipulation in these prophecies to inscribe power upon these people. So this is, to my mind as a historian, quite fascinating, quite complicated. Now, the importance of this becomes all the greater when Europeans begin to penetrate this, this area in the early 1890s. And we begin to get Nandi resistance against that penetration. And very early on, the resistance to British incursions becomes associated with a particular or Coyote, a man named Coitelel. Now, at this point in the early 1890s, there are several Talai or Koyik practicing among the Nandi. The Nandi at that time are divided into at least 11 different locational sections. And each section or pair or three of sections has its own or Koyik. So there are at least seven or eight or Koyik practicing among the Nandi at this time, who are all thought to have these powers. Several of these people are named in the early colonial sources. So we get some traces of them appearing in the, in, 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 in the written sources. And many more are named in the oral histories. So why does Koitalel emerge as the most important? Well, it appears that he takes it upon himself to lead a resistance movement to organize the Nandi for battle. And we know he is involved in several major skirmishes with the British and several organized attacks on British posts and British bases. So that by 1898-99, the British are actually hunting Coitalel. They're trying to track him down. He becomes a problem. So next slide, please. So between the mid-1890s and 1905, there are five different Nandi risings that require the British to send in expeditionary forces to try and defeat them. This is the most protracted and most convoluted resistance that any Kenyan group makes to colonial conquest. It's the most interesting, I think, of all the, the risings. Now, in the fifth Nandi rising in 1905, uh, the British send the largest expeditionary force they will ever send anywhere in Eastern Africa on any mission at all to defeat the Nandi. They seal off the entire Nandi area and they move in three different columns into the Nandi lands and they operate a, a kind of scorched earth policy. They burn people's huts, they chase them out. Uh, they are using also in this, in this attack, they're using Maasai auxiliaries as they called them. That meant they Maasai mercenaries would be a better word. Who, who, who fight with them. And the Maasai basically attack the village and round up the women and cattle and take captives. That's their reward for their service. And the British mop up and then move on to the next village. So this is a very major military operation. And in that operation, Koitalel and the Nandi forces put up a staunch resistance. At one battle early on, they almost defeat a British regiment. They come very close to winning the battle. So during the campaign, Coitlel becomes quite feared by the British. Now, one of the British officers involved in the campaign is a junior officer called Richard Meinitzhagen. He is British, but of German descent. And he is pictured in the two images I've put up on this slide. One of him um, at the railway sidings as they're being constructed near Nakuru and the other one in his Nairobi barracks in his military uniform. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Minus Hagen is assigned as the duty officer for Nandi during the campaign. He is living on the edge of the Nandi area. He has 
several Nandi speaking individuals working in his um, on his compound. He uses them as spies and he manages to make contact through them with Koitalel. Koitalel accordingly agrees to meet Manitz Hagen under a flag of truce to discuss possible peace terms. At least that's how Manitz Hagen puts it. We don't know how Koitalel puts it. All we know is from the oral sources that a meeting was arranged between them. So Meinitz Hagen goes to the meeting with a, a small body of British soldiers, but they're armed with a Gatling gun, that's a, a, an early machine gun, which they mount on a hill just behind where the meeting is meant to take place. And their idea is from the very beginning treacherous. So Meinitz Hagen is planning to go in under the flag of truce, but he tells his officers that when he gives the signal there to open fire, He's anticipating that they will break this, this meeting into violence. Koitalel, we're not sure again, what does he think? Well, he certainly, when he comes to the meeting, he's surrounded behind him by an array of some 60, 70 warriors, all armed to the teeth. So clearly also expecting trouble. And they stand there, many of them with their bows loaded, ready to fire. So they're also not being negligent. When, um, excuse me, when Meinitz Hagen comes towards Koitalel to greet him, Koitalel is holding a bundle of grasses, which the oral sources tell us is a, is a symbol of peace. And as he holds out the bundle of grasses to Meinitz Hagen, Meinitz Hagen grabs his arm, pulls him towards him, puts his pistol under Koitalel's skin that he's wearing, and fires through the chest under his, his sternum. As soon as this happens, all hell breaks out. Arrows are flying in every direction. The soldiers with Meinitz Hagen claim they did not know he was going to do this. So they are shocked, and it takes them a moment or two to gather their wits. They are immediately assailed into close combat by 60 to 70 armed Nandi warriors, and there is one hell of a fight. The British soldiers are outnumbered, and they retreat very quickly back towards the Gatling gun on the hill. The Gatling gun can't fire because everybody is mixed up, so it can't relieve them. So as they come back, they suffer some losses, but they eventually get back towards the hill, and they decide to make a full retreat. So everyone decamps and starts heading back as fast as they can, chased all the way by the Nandi warriors. And they get back to their, their fort where they've built a small zariba. And they are under fire there for the next three nights, hemmed in. So this is a, so even after Koitalel's death, this fighting continues. Now I tell that story in some detail because I can. And I can because what happens afterwards is that Meinitz Hagen's fellow officers are so shocked by what has happened that they want him prosecuted. They allege that he betrayed them by attacking an enemy under a flag of truce. And they request a formal courts martial. Now there is in fact an, inqu an inquiry into Meinitz Hagen's conduct and the initial inquiry by his commanding officer exonerates him of all blame. Meinitz Hagen claims when he gives evidence that Koitalel was about to spear him. Koitalel didn't have a spear in his hand. We know that from other sources. Um, so Meinitz Hagen gives a false defense. So the first inquiry exonerates him, and then the officers are so concerned they try again. And this time there's a formal courts martial and Manitz Hagen is made to stand and be prosecuted. But again, he is acquitted of any offense. But in that case, he's acquitted because they don't believe they've got sufficient evidence to reach a decision. So in other words, you might say that was a, a hung jury. They couldn't reach a full decision. And I tell you that story to emphasize the fact that 
even though it, it is undoubtedly an act of treachery, not everyone on the British side was at all comfortable with this. It didn't play well. It should not have happened. But Meinitzhagen eventually gets off scot-free. Now, in later life, Meinitzhagen will claim to have taken trophies that day. He claimed to have a cloak that belonged to Koitlel. He claimed to have a, a, a staff and a rungu that he says he took from Koitlel's dead body. No way. We know the description of that battle from so many different sources, including other British soldiers. There wasn't time for anyone to take loot from anything or anybody. Those elements, those things that, were, that he alleged he took from Coitlail were never taken from Coitlail. Now, this is a great shame because those artifacts, Meinitzhagen's family later returned to Nandi, and they're now on display in Coitlail's mausoleum in Nandi Hills. And I've been to see them, and they're, they're beautifully displayed. It's very nicely done, but I very much doubt that those are authentic artifacts. Now, another reason for doubting this is that Meinitz Hagen later in life was known to be a fraudster. He lied about many other such things, including plagiarizing publications. He was supposed to be a great ornithologist. He plagiarized works on ornithology. He made up stories about having discovered new species of birds, etc., etc., etc. In other words, the man was a serial liar and fraudster, and he liked playing games. Yeah, and he sold things to museums, pretending they were artifacts that were not really artifacts at all. I'm sure he's up there now thinking this is all very funny, because that's the kind of guy I think he was. So unfortunately, I don't think the things in the mausoleum are, are authentic, but I do appreciate that Nandi want those kind of symbols and they want them, they want to appreciate what they mean. It's just a pity the context here is, is the way it is. So that's the story of Koitlel's death. Um, so we know who killed Koitlel, there's no doubt about it. And there's no doubt at all it was a murder, even though it was done during a military campaign. It was an illegal killing. Now what happens after this is the story that's not so well known, but needs to be better known. Because the Nandi, having been defeated in the next few weeks after Koitlel's death, are displaced from their lands and moved into a native reserve that's about one third of the size of the lands they'd previously occupied. And this, I think, has never been stressed enough in the histories. The Nandi are compressed into this small area and they are displaced. Many Nandi actually try to flee. They go to El Geo, they go to Kipsigis, they even go up into Pakot to other Kalindian speakers. So this is a tumultuous period between 1905 and 1907 of Nandi displacement. And it, it, it continues to rankle. And over 1906-07, the Nandi rising kind of continues. There are skirmishes, there are attempts to break out of the reserve. Lots of things keep happening. So this resistance doesn't die. It continues. Next slide, please. Now, this, this image that I've put in, because I want to try and clarify something else that is, is interesting and misleading. So after Koitlel's killing and after the reserve is created, the British need to work out a way to administer Nandi and to run it. And they're quite keen to try and keep the peace. They only have these warrior groups who keep trying to break out and keep trying to organize risings. In the British conception of things at the time, they see the Okoyik as the kings of Nandi, as the leaders. And they recognize they have some authority over military matters and the warriors. So what they decide to do in 1908 is to make the Okoyot the head chief of all of Nandi. But Koitlel is dead, so the man they choose is Kepeles. Now, Kepeles was one of Koitlel's rivals before the 1905 rising. 
And there's significant evidence in the oral histories that Capelles and Coitlel were not exactly friendly with one another. Very different characters, very different attitudes. So Capelles quite willingly steps forward and becomes what I suppose we might call a collaborator. He takes the shilling from the English and he becomes the chief of the location. Now, these two images are two images that you can find if you Google Capelles, or, or rather if you Google Coitelel, you'll find these two images. And on most websites, it says it's Coitelel. It's not Coitelel. Coitelel is by this time dead. The websites are wrong. Don't believe them. The photographs were taken by a European administrator, a very clever and articulate man called A.C. Hollis, who spoke African languages and took trouble to listen to people and wrote some very interesting things about what he saw. And Hollis photographed several interesting things. So the photograph on the left is of Capelles surrounded by what Hollis calls his advisors. And these are other members of the Talai clan. And then on the right is Capelles photographed on his own. And it's that photograph that appears everywhere as Coitelel. It's not Coitelel. I've tried informing the people who run these websites, but they're just not interested. <laughs> they, they think it's Coitelel. They don't seem to care that it isn't Coitelel. The fact is one of Coitelel's enemies, I think, just deepens the problem, <laughs> makes it worse. Uh, but there we are. Um, and of course, Capellus is not a hero of resistance. And what offends me is that these images often appear on websites that are heralding the heroes of Kenyan resistance. Capellus was not a resistor. That's not what his role was at all, by any means. Now, what the Capellus story reveals for us is that the, the next twist in this tale of the Okoyak is that the British try and turn them into chiefs. In other words, they give them power. Now, the result of this is that the Okoyak immediately start abusing that power and using it for self-accumulation and in order to organize resistance against the British. So the British make a very bad mistake here. So next slide, please. So, sorry, has my microphone gone? Is it still live? Yeah, good. Um, so next, uh, the, the next bit of this story is that after the Nandi are defeated, they have their own political leaders arrested and deported. So one reason why the British are looking for someone to be a chief among the Nandi is that they've taken all the other chiefs away. They've moved them. Now, those deported political prisoners are also unheralded in the history. Yet there are archive files, as I show in this illustration, down the road here in the National Archive, with papers about these people, who they were, their names, their families, etc. So we should try and recover these people, I think, in the history and tell something about them, because these are victims of the conquest as much as anyone else. So their deportation is very important. They were convicted of insurrection and they were deported to other parts of Kenya. So some of them are in Malindi, some are in Lamu, some are moved to Turkana, others are moved to North Nyeri, Morango. So yeah, they're, 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 some of you know the story I could hear. Like it. Thank you. So they are deported, they are moved around. Um, so there's a story to be told around these people also. And we know that some of them, in the places they're moved to, become something like local celebrities. They are known in these places. People are aware. These people try to resist, and they are respected for it. But those people deported were not Okoyik. The only Okoyik the, Okoyik the British aimed at was Koitalil. The others they now put into positions of authority. Now, unfortunately, Capelles and the others around him began what is described by many Nandi as extortion. They started taxing the local population rather than the British. And those taxes went to the Okoyik, not to the British authorities. And we know this because it's reported in the oral histories, but also because the British later find out about it and realize what's been going on. Also, the Okoyak being in charge causes great disruption because some people are very fearful of this. 
they're afraid of what the alcoholic might do, and they start moving away from the areas where the alcoholic are. And in the colonial archives, we see the colonial official reporting this. They don't understand it, but they're reporting it's happening. And they say, why are these people moving? They, they don't seem to want to be near the chief. That's because the chief's dangerous. <laughs> they're getting away the distance they can. Then into this story come Christian missions. By 1908, into Nandi, a little bit later, into Kipsigis. And these Christian missions start trying to win converts and bring people to the church. And they find the Alcoic very much opposes them and stands between the young men in particular and church affiliation. So a contestation emerges between these occult practitioners and the Christian churches. Now, th this is maybe not surprising, given the church's attitudes towards occult powers at this time, but it's very important in shaping what happens next. <clears throat> so the next bit of the story that that is important concerns a man who is often described as Koitalel's brother, Koilegin Arap Kipchomba, who is said to have moved to Kipsigis from Nandi at the time of Koitalel's killing. So he's said to have fled. Now, we do know he was one of the other Okoyak in Nandi in 1904. So we think that's true. Is he Koitalel's brother? Your guess is as good as mine. Because I think with these Okoyak lineages, there's a tendency to make false kinship. So if people are powerful, they're, they're equated with a relationship. And that relationship may be fictional rather than factual. But they are often said to be blood brothers. So Koilengen sets up as chief, like Kepeles in Nandi, Koilengen is set up as chief in Kiricho. And even more than, than um, Kepeles, he begins extorting. And there, the mission, the Christian mission, starts spying on him and reporting what he's doing. And eventually, Koilegan is dismissed as chief and eventually prosecuted and also deported. And his household is, is, is disrupted and the wealth that he's accumulated is taken by the British. So by 1912-13, when this is happening, the British are learning their mistake about empowering the Okoyik. But even as that's happening, other Okoyik are still organizing resistance. So the next bit of the story is that in 1923, five years after the end of the Second World War, the Nandi Okoyik Barcerion Arab Kimanye organizes a rising in Nandi. And Barcerion is again, allegedly, Koitalel's son. Again, your guess is as good as mine. I very much doubt that he is, but everybody believes he is. And in the oral histories, he's now always presented that way. It's interesting, if you look at some of the early histories in the 1900s, 1910s, they're not sure of his relationship. By the 1930s, 40s, everyone says it's a son. And I think that's the way these prophetic histories go. They become self-reinforcing. But Baserion becomes a very important actor. In 1923, he's still a very young man. But the importance of this date is that it falls with the generational transition I described earlier. There's to be a generational transition that year. And the colonial authorities agree to the ceremony be held, being held on a farm in uh, the Wasangishu district near the Nandi border. So an organization has been made to bring something like seven, 8,000 warriors to that place at one time. And Baserion is planning to do more than just have the ceremony. He's planning to mount a rising when these people get there. Uh, informers who are Christian converts to the local mission give this away, and the plot is discovered. And a battalion of military turn up, and before the ceremony, all the main protagonists are arrested. And Baserion is put on trial is convicted, and again is deported. Uh, he at first goes to Umfangano Island in Lake uh, Victoria. 
was very near to Guasi, where this story will end up a little later. At the same time as this happens, the British become suspicious that maybe other Okoyik are also plotting and scheming. So they, they do some investigations and they discover in other parts of Nandi there are indeed things going on that they don't like. So at that point, they confine the Nandi Talai to one location in Nandi. That's location 9, Tapsasiwa, where the Talai clan today still are in that same location. So that happens in the mid 1920s. Next slide, please. This brings us to the part of the story that I suspect many of you may have heard a little bit about, and that's the the Libons removal ordinance. Now, this is at first sight quite confusing. Firstly, you will know that Libon is the Maasai occult practitioner, yet the British used that word to describe an ordinance that would remove the Okoyik. So they conflated the two terms. So what the ordinance will do, it'll remove the Okoyik, who the British are calling Libons, right? And that's confused lots of people. So don't feel ashamed and embarrassed if you were confused by that. It confuses lots of nice students, confuses everybody, yeah? So the Libons removal ordinance is about the removal of the Okoyik from Kipsigis not Nandi, yeah? So the Nandi Talai remain where they are in location nine, but the Kipsigis or Koyik are to be removed from Kipsigis completely. Now this ordinance, and I'll explain why they did this in a moment, but let me tell you what the ordinance is first. It is a totally unique piece of British legislation. There is nothing like it that I can find in any other British colony. So what it does is it identifies a group of people by their lineage, so a clan. It lists them by name of patriarch, wives for each patriarch, children for each wife, and it places all those names in the ordinance as persons to be deported. So the list of people runs to more than 700. And it includes children and babies. And they are to be deported with all their chattels and belongings, which means all their household goods, their animals, everything, their chickens, you name it, they're all going. So this is quite a unique piece of legislation. And it required a very strong administration to bring it about. So over two years between mid-1934 and the end of 1935, this ordinance is enforced. And these families are removed from Caricio and the Caricio area to Guasi. And Guasi is on the shores of Lake Victoria, opposite Mumfangano Manf Island. Guasi, as we'll come to in a moment, is a very unhealthy place, and these people suffer very, very gravely in Guasi. So why are they removed? Why this wonderful piece of legislation that's totally unique? So <clears throat> this story takes us back to the mid-1920s, when another Orkoyik, another member of the Orkoyik clan, a man called Sitonik, sometimes known as Sitonik the Sorcerer, organized some resistance against the British. From what we can work out, Sitonik, like Berserion, was planning a rising. And he was gathering weapons, because by then he'd realized having some European-style ballistic weapons might be a good idea. He was gathering resources. He was gathering explosives. He was gathering money to organize a Kipsigis rising. And he was sending... Um, warrior groups to raid places to get these resources. So they were targeting European settler farms and European settler homes where they could steal money and steal weapons. And a whole spate of burglaries occurred over the Western Highlands that were linked to Sidonik's activities. The police began to recognize a pattern in this. They began to realize something was going on but they didn't know quite what it was. 
until they began to realize it was connected to cattle rustling and cattle raiding also going on. And they started interrogating some of the suspects and beginning to realize there were some common relationships in the people organizing these activities. Again, they received information from Christian catechists at the local mission who found out about some of the activities of Sitonik and his accomplices and reported these to the police. Can such evidence be relied upon? It's difficult to know. Difficult to know. But these guys were certainly convinced that Sidonik was up to no good and that what he was doing was certainly against their Christian interests. The case came to a head when uh, a group of Kipsigis raided a farm on the Kinangop, the Semini farm, and where the, they, they, they were apprehended. They thought the farm was empty. It wasn't. They were apprehended. There was a fight on the veranda of the farm, and Mr. Semini was very badly wounded and eventually died of his injuries. And then in circumstances that are not at all clear, uh, Mrs. Semini was also assaulted. And that assault was, was sexual. We don't quite know how or why that happened. But that, of course, made the headlines and brought even greater attention to this case. The guys who did the attack, the burglary, they made the mistake of taking clothing from the house. And they were all identified by the next week because they were found in possession of the clothing. So the evidence that they had done it was pretty clear. And then they all gave evidence admitting to what had happened. They were all tried and they were all convicted of murder and five of them hanged. The evidence that they brought forward was then put together with other evidence and a large case was made against Sitonik and his accomplices. Now this document is about a 17 page report and it's entitled The Big Eight. And that's what the police started calling Sitonik and his seven accomplices. It's very much like an English policeman to invent a phrase like this to describe something. Um, it's very dramatic. Uh, but basically, there were eight Okoyuk who were being identified as involved in this conspiracy, that they were all aware of what was going on, and they were all aiming at some kind of resistance movement. This was described in the report as a crime wave, but a crime wave with a political purpose. And it was that political purpose that justified the Libon's removal ordinance. So you're removing these people because none of them could be trusted, because all of the Talai allegedly had these powers. And therefore, if you simply put the big eight in prison, you wouldn't solve the problem, because there'd be another big eight coming forward very soon. So that was the logic that went behind the removal. So next slide, please. So here I want to pay tribute to local historians here in Kenya who've worked on large elements of this story. And I, I want to emphasize the story I'm telling is, is, is known to many local historians who are very familiar with it. And I claim no originality in what I say. David Tui in particular, Atalai himself, has written very interestingly and very extensively about the Kipsigis Talai. Godfrey Sang, is Godfrey here or is he online? He's, there you are, Godfrey, hi there. Godfrey also, very distinguished writer and author on this subject. And I'm sure, Godfrey, you know every word I've said so far you could have said. Uh, so these guys have been producing history around this. But my sense is, and I'd be interested to hear what Godfrey thinks later, is that it's not much listened to beyond Western, the Western Highlands. The rest of Kenya kind of doesn't tune into this. And that's one of my issues. Because I think this is actually very important for Kenya as a whole. And Godfrey's written quite extensively about the experiences I'm about to talk about when these guys go in exile and exclusion to Gwasi. And the strongest part of David Tui's book, which is why I've put it up on this slide, is about the Gwasi experience. Because for those families who, who were migrated to Gwasi, it was horrific, utterly horrific. Gwasi was deeply unhealthy. They had no immunities to the diseases there. They had no familiarity. It was highly malarial. They had trepanosomiasis and sleeping sickness. Uh, they, they all caught all kinds of infections. So there were very dramatic health impacts on the community almost from day one. 
And that health implication got worse in waves over the next few years. So the community suffered recurrent problems and they, they experienced very high infant mortality, for example, something Godfrey has highlighted in his work. They suffered very badly from sleeping sickness at times when sleeping sickness was almost unknown in other parts of Kenya. And there is a strong argument to say that the government knew all this and that they knew all this before they sent it to Gwasi. And that part of the punishment of being sent to Gwasi was bad health. They can they can go there. Who cares? It's their prison. Now, this is quite important because it will affect later on, we'll come back to some claims that are currently being made for reparations around this issue. And the Gwasi experience is very central to that. So the fact that we acknowledge that the, the exile in Gwasi was a very, very severe and harsh punishment and affected women and children as much as it affected those who the state knew were guilty of crimes is something I think we should reflect upon. But as well as affecting health, the, 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 the exile to Gwasi affected other things too. Talai mobility was restricted. So Talai could not leave Gwasi without permission. And that permission was very rarely given. So of course, this became an issue. And there were real problems then around marriage. How did you make marriages outside of your clan if the only people you could live with were your clan? So this initially seemed to be an attempt to end Kipsigi's Talai marriage. So was this a genocidal decision? Did this want to see the end of the Talai? Was the intent to prevent marriage? So these issues were debated at the time, and the Talai themselves petitioned the government and tried to have these things changed, and they did get some concessions. But it took several years for those changes to be made. And in that time, Talai would find other ways around this problem. Young people often escaped from Gwasi, came to other places. But, Gwasi, but the British were aware of this and tried to stop it. So, for example, as you will know, Kipsigis at this time were quite commonly recruited into the British military, the King's African Rifles. Talai members were banned from recruitment. You weren't supposed to recruit Talai at all. Why? Because they couldn't be trusted. They might be organizing insurrection. Now, we do know that some Talai did get into the military. They got around this. But the attempt was there, nevertheless, to ban them. And also at Gwasi, I think I'm right saying, Godfrey, there were no schools initially. There, there may have been schools set up by the Talai themselves a little later, but there was no provision of any education for the children at all. And certainly by the time the Talai come back to Caricho in 1960, I think, 60, 61, yeah, their education is their way off. They're way behind. And they're going to struggle for the next 10 years after that to make up the ground they've lost. And the youngsters of that generation had a very hard time, I think, coming back to Karicha. So exile is about more than the politics. It's about the social and physical experience that Talai undergo. And the important thing is that this is, this is families. This is not just the male elders or the male warriors who've done bad things, being punished. This is families. Next slide, please. So through this experience, after the Libon's removal ordinance, which is 1934, through to the 40s and 50s, the British really put the Talai under surveillance. So if you now read through the colonial archive for this period, what you discover is that there is, there's lots of uh, watching of Talai. Talai are monitored and reported on every few months in the files. So there's lots of information about what they're doing, which for a historian is always very useful. But of course, that information all comes from a particular European mindset. So you can't rely on it for truth. It's giving you evidence of something, but maybe not truth. But in this period, also some interesting things happen that I'm not going to say too much about, but I do want to highlight. Because some of these things may be connected in ways that you're not fully aware. So firstly, Kapsasiwa, the location where the Nandi Talai are, is becoming quite overcrowded. And they have problems by the 1940s, 1950s with that. 
and they try and get permission for Talai to leave, to allow them to get out. So even in Nandi, there are problems with administering it. Similar things happen in El Geo, where the Europeans in 1937 make a list of all the Talai by name and their families by name and chart them. And they, for example, they can't get they can't get Kipande to go to look for work. They're not allowed it. So they're confined like prisoners at Tambach. And the chief Okoyuk, the elders among them, they insist that they live within sight of the district commissioner's bungalow. So they're literally placed under strict surveillance. Then we come to the Kaloa Afray, 1950, which some of you may know of, which is an event in Baringo district where a group of young Pakot men attack a, a, a small police platoon headed by a European district commissioner. They kill the district commissioner and another of the police and two others. They are led by a man called Lucas Pakesh. Now, Lucas Pakesh claims to be a prophet. He's not a Talai, but he claims connection, not to Talai themselves, but to the equivalent among Pakot or the Wurkoi. Very similar word, similar pronunciation, same people, really. Um, and Pakech claims connection to them. And Pakech is also linked to the Dini Yamasambwa movement. Now, Dini Yamasambwa at this time is organizing protests and resistance against colonialism. And Pakech is involved in that. And he tries to marry that with Okoyot protests. Now, um, after Pakech's death, within the next three or four years, various kinds of revolt break out among the Bakot, the Yomut movement particularly, and Dini Amosamawa itself takes on its own cult among Bakot. Now, this is all again linked to Wakoi and Wakoi's role in it. And at one point, people in Bakot begin attacking the Wakoi because they believe they are the cause of this misfortune. In other words, people turn against them because they think they're organizing trouble. Now, those events are very tumultuous in Pakot, but were not widely publicized in the rest of Kenya. Why? Because this is the middle of the Mama Rebellion, and the British have something else to worry about. So this stuff is largely put to one side. But how many of you knew there were three detention camps in West Pakot, in which seven to 8,000 Pakot were held for periods of three to four years? for their role in Dini Yamasambwa. And those detention camps were run on exactly the same basis as the detention camps in central Kenya, with exactly the same structures and controls. And yes, none of the people in these camps were convicted of anything. They were all placed there on suspicion of being Dini Yamasambwa followers. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> and that is a history that really, I think Kenyans should know something about because it's not just in Central Province that these detention camps were operating. Now, by this time, another complicating factor, as, as the Dini Yamasamwa connection suggests, some Talai have become Christian. They've gone to the churches. Now, yes, I can see a few raised eyebrows. This is surprising. Why would occult practitioners in a traditional mode go to Christianity? And I regret, I can't answer that for you. I'm, I'm as puzzled as you are. I'm not sure. But they, but they go, they seem to find solace in the church. And interestingly, often the church pastors welcome them. And they very quickly emerge into position of authority in the churches, church elders. And some even end up training as pastors themselves. And we'll come back to that later. Because even today, that's still the case. One of those who goes to the church is Basarion Arab Kimani, Kotelel's son from 1923, who led that rebellion when he was perhaps only 19 years old. By the 1950s, Basarion has been allowed out of detention. He comes back to Nandi and he organizes his own syncretic church, which is based upon a mixture of Orkoic belief and Christianity. And he particularly gathers around him Nandi squatters. Now, some of you will know that in the 1940s and early 50s, many Nandi working on the farms of Transanzoya 
and Wasangishu were evicted. They'd been there as squatters, and they were evicted as those farms mechanized. And those people had come back to the Nandi Reserve, but they'd lacked land and they'd lacked resources. Those individuals, Basarian gathered around him, and he turned them into a small army. And Basarian arranged for them to go to a place on the edge of, of Lycipia, a place called the Wasagez Valley. And the plan was in Wasagez, they would arm themselves and they would attack the European farms on Lycipia escarpment above Wasagez. And in uh, 1956, late 56, Basarian was arrested in the Wasagez Valley with 750 followers. And in the valley around them were found stashes of weapons, mainly bows and arrows, but large supplies of poisons for the arrows, etc., et all discovered in the Wasagas Valley. And again, why don't you know about this? Because it was never publicized at the time, because this again is the middle of the Mama Rebellion. And as far as the British were concerned, the Kalenjin were loyal. So you didn't want this kind of story getting around. So, interesting, Basarion described, he, he told his followers that they were going to Lycipia to take back the promised land. So he used a biblical allusion for what they were doing. But they were going to seize the promised land, and they were taking this land because of the land that had been stolen from the Nandi in 1905. So he's making that historical connection between these events. So Basarion is... Arrested, convicted again, exiled again. He's back on Mumfangano Island. Um, and the photograph I've put here, I'm, a, I'm a, sorry, it's a stock photograph from the Star Newspapers archive, so I couldn't remove the Star's label across it. I'm sorry about that. But I'm sure you recognize the other man in this photograph, Mumze Jomo Kenyatta. And here he is with Basarion. It's the only picture I can find of Basarion. If anyone can find another picture of Basarion, I'd love to have it. But this is the only one I can find. And this is Basarion uh, Kenyatta letting him out of prison in 1964. So in the prison releases following independence, you'll be aware Kenyatta made several prison releases. Basarion was one of the people pardoned and released. And here's him meeting Kenyatta uh, on his release. Next slide, please. How much longer have I got, Kenneth? Five minutes, OK. So coming to conclusion, after colonialism, the Kipsigis down in Gwasi are pardoned and they're allowed to return to Caricho. Um, again, Godfrey knows a great deal about this more than I do, but that return is quite difficult because they don't have the resources and, it, and it, they're not much help with it. So they come back in dribs and drabs. And when they get back, they find maybe they're not so welcome at home. What land can they have? Well, no one seems to know. Where can they put them? No one seems to know. How will their kids go to school? No one seems to know. So they struggle to establish themselves. They try appealing to the government. And here is a photograph again of the Lembus Council with two Orkoyek uh, sitting there between Ken beside Kenyatta. They try and appeal for support. And while the government acknowledges them, it doesn't give them anything. Now, over the next 20, 30 years, they'll continue to petition government, but no one's really listening. From time to time, a district officer or a district commissioner will promise them a bit of land here, a bit of land there. And Moy made one or two promises to them at various rallies. President Moy was often doing that, but it was often quite hard to turn those promises into reality. And the Talai struggled all along. Increasingly, they got absorbed into churches and more and more Talai, from what I can understand, Christianized. I, I don't know what the proportion would be. It'd be interesting to hear from Godfrey what you think about that afterwards, whether what proportion of Talai you think Christianized in this period. It seems to me maybe quite high, maybe quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And um then then if we come a little bit further forward, they there continued to be rumors of um of Talai involvement in, in crime and in stock theft. I have no way of knowing if these are true. I have no way of testing the veracity of what is said, but these accusations would fly around and almost whenever anything happened, you kind of blamed the Talai. And maybe that was what was going on, a blame game. 
But that association made people nervous. And now and again, there'd be incidents. There were there were witch killings in Tinderet that were to do with Talai there, which again, the Talai were, I think, victimized. So they become almost like a pariah population in this period where people are trying to avoid them. There's also coming further forward, continued involvement and accusations against Thai Talai in the violence of 2008. Again, I'm not sure how true this is, whether it's just one or two individuals, I have no idea. But these accusations are again easily made. By that time though, and this is my conclusion, the Talai are quite involved in claim making. They want to be recompensated. They want some reparations for their dispossessions and especially for the deportation to Gwasi. And they start to think about putting forward a legal claim. And some of the people in this room, I think, have been involved in that. And I'm sure some of our friends online will, will have something to say about that. Uh, this legal case, as I understand it, is still ongoing. Uh, the Historical uh, Claims Commission has been consulted, and I think there are depositions being made. Uh, the case, I think, has become connected in some way to the claims in Caricho being made over lost T estate lands, which is another legal case. I'm not sure the two are really connected, but I'd be interested to hear in the discussion what others think about that. But this claim is going forward, and I think it will emerge in something substantial. Uh, the basis of its claim for reparation, of course, will be very different than the other ones we've heard of in Kenya, the Mau Mau claim, for example. This is a very different case. But I think it's a very interesting case and quite a compelling case, because as I say, the legislation that reinforced it was utterly unique. So you can't justify it by saying, oh, we did that everywhere. No, you didn't. You just did that here. So it's a very interesting case, and I'd be interested in more of it. And then just to finish up with, I said I'd show you some contemporary issues. So this is a Gardo's tribute to President Moy. Some of you will remember seeing this cartoon. And what I'm interested in is uh, is uh, is President Moy's Rungu, his Nobukuri, uh, which he's holding in his right hand, not the left hand that's silencing his estranged wife's mouth from speaking, but um, his his not his Rungu. So the the Talai now claim that that staff was given to Moy by the Talai in the mid 1960s when he was vice president. Mm -hmm. And they claim that there were prophecies made at the time that if he accepted the gift, he would become president one day, putting the words into the mouths of the prophets. Huh? And that he was connected in some way, therefore, to the Talai. I'm sure you know this man, your current president. There he is on the morning of 5th June 2020, at Capsisiwa, location 9, of Nandi County. He's arrived at 5 a.m. in the morning with an entourage of followers. He's gone into the home of a very prominent Talai leader, and he's emerged wearing an animal skin, and he's gone up on a local hill, and there that morning he's been blessed as the sun came up by some senior Okoyik. He returned to their home and took tea and then went back to Nairobi. And this is an example of a, of a good old Kalenjin politician having it both ways. Yes, of course, Mr. Rono is a, is a, a, is a member of an important church, but he also understands the power of the occult. He understands that Talai are important people. He respects what they represent. And so he subjects himself to the indignity of taking his nice suit off, putting on an animal skin, and being blessed by having milk spat over his head at six in the morning on a cold Nandi hill. And then lastly, just to comment on, I mentioned Koitalel's mausoleum. Here it is, uh, part of Kenya's heritage and a very important part of that heritage. And I want to end on this because I, I don't want what I've said in any way to be taken as a denigration of that memory and that place. Because my point is that this is a very, very important element of Kenya's history. This continued resistance of this group, the things they've done, the things they've tried to achieve, need to be recognized and properly understood. 
not misconstrued and misrepresented by falsehoods and by ignorance. And this mausoleum, the staff there, they do their very best to keep that memory alive and to sustain the heritage of Kenya's history through Koitaleel's memory. I think that mausoleum should be expanded. I think it should say more about the Talai generally. I think it should incorporate some of the ambiguities I've mentioned today, but I'm very much in favor of popular history of this kind being conveyed to the Kenyan public. Thank you very much indeed. Well, putting words into the mouth of the prophet. It's, it's quite interesting. Now, um, before we go in for questions and uh, answers, to discuss uh, Professor Anderson's presentation is Professor Masharia Munene. Just like uh, Professor Anderson, uh, Professor Munene, welcome home. <laughs> welcome home uh, because uh, Professor Munene is the former chair of the Department of History and Archaeology, this department that I chair. I sometimes say I stand on the shoulders of giants, and, and you can see one today. <laughs> Um, at the moment, he is a professor of history and international relations at the United States International University here in Nairobi. And he's also a professional friend of the National Defense College in Nairobi. Professor holds a PhD in diplomatic history from Ohio University in the United States. And uh, he is widely published and one of uh, his very widely used publication is uh, Historical Reflections on Kenya, Intellectual Adventures, Politics and International Relations. Prof, welcome. I should mention that we were classmates, only that he used to stand in class while I used to sit. Thank you, Prof. Um, thank you very much. Ken, thank you very much, David. I think you also engage in intellectual adventure, which is okay. Um, it's a very nice uh, presentation about the Talai and the marriage of <clears throat> the Maasai and the Kalenjin to produce Okoyots sometimes associated with the Talai. Now, the gist of the presentation, it appeared was the British fear of these Okoyots, irrespective of how many they were. You hear that there is an Okoyot somewhere who claimed to be a seer, a prophet of some sort, and he's going to prophesy something you don't like, so fix the guy. And uh, so that's the essentially uh, what I got. Apart from that, the Talai and other things, the Talai as a people being forgotten in their suffering. And the suffering was intense and continues to be intense. So I think Professor Anderson was saying, hey, uh, look at this. There's something here. Eh? Uh, I don't know whether Isaac Tarus is around eh? because I was just discussing this issue with him uh, a few days ago. And um, like Kenneth, Tarus was also a classmate. <laughs> and... Um, but he's very concerned about it. I don't know. Have you talked to him? Have you, he, okay. Yeah. In fact, I was telling him he should um, do some serious work on this so that the story is better known than it is. So thank you, David, for bringing that up. Um, apart from the suffering, 
the Talai. And the attempts by some people to exploit the Talai through association. Um, we have similarities and questions that apply somewhere else. Yes, the Talai appear to have been forgotten, but if you listen carefully, somebody will come and say, you know, the Trokana, we also did. <laughs> and how come you don't talk about the Trokana? Or, okay, or some, essentially, there are a lot of people who are forgotten in the mainstream history. And they are complaining. So the mission is for those oh. who are interested to unforget the forgotten, eh? to bring them up into the to the limelight. And I think David is doing that in a nice way. Although I know David sometimes likes looking at the unusual and make it usual. Eh? <laughs> I remember the time he was uh, fighting very hard. Uh, you should write, talk about the the home guards, you see, they're also there. Because eh? <laughs> the tendency is to look at the other side and forget one. So this would be in that line of trying to unearth or bring up the forgotten in order to make a full picture of what is the history of Kenya. So in that sense, he's doing very well. So along the way, he, kept, he mentioned at least one thug, and he told us he was a fraud. <laughs> Captain Menatagin. Um, but he, has a, he had a record of brutality. Right here in Kehomboine, he wiped out a whole village. Why? Well, the villagers had made a mistake of making somebody die by forcing him to drink unpleasant record liquid. And uh, so he came and said, I'll wipe them out. That's before he went to Nandi. Eh? And then he also, in his mischievous ways, he was also cunning. Eh? So he looked at what was going on, particularly this Mudaiga area. And he said, one day, a war will break out. Serious war. And then he went to trick or coyote and uh, kill him, as David has explained very well. This, um, it was unexpected that a so-called honorable officer would do such a thing. But then Mena Sagan would not be the first person who pretended to be honorable and did a lot of strange things. Eh? They were John Boyes. Eh? Yeah. And apart from John Boyes, of course, there was Francis Hall who arrested Boyes and the guy could not be convicted because there were no white people to say he did it. So it was not a surprise that Maynard Sagan would be let go. <laughs> Who are the witnesses? And the crown, the British crown, cannot be wrong in its pacification process. Could not be wrong in containing the natives and making them see sense. So just like Francis Hall, who predicted a war in the future, and hoped that he would not be there to see it. Of course, he was not there because he died very quickly thereafter. But what you have with Menetzagen is a pattern of imperialism and conquest. No guilt felt about it. So he did. And the presentation of pretenders to leadership. So Kepele, eh? So this uh, thug who joined the conquerors and then was made a chief 
And as David tells us, we have been misled to be seeing a picture of a thug and think that he was all coherent. The success of the British manipulation of information in order to create a conducive control. So Coyote dead. That picture could not have been his because he was dead. Yet issues. Call it the British of say this is the guy. Yeah? And because he was revered, so you are given somebody to revere here. And the person you are given is very good in being the leader and uh, making sure that his pockets were properly replenished through goats. Then along with that, things that comes up is those to try and get with as a way of claiming legitimacy. People who are not legitimate by association then claim what? Legitimacy. And because they do that, you are forced to accept it and even believe a lie. So the transfer of senses of legitimacy could be seen in that created chief. Very much like Karuri Wagakure and Kenyanji Gadirimo. Created beings, then heralded as heroes. So villains become what? Heroes. Huh? And on heroes' days, you celebrate villains in the name of heroes. Uh, <laughs> peculiar. And because of ignorance, which David was trying to bring up. You accept it. And we celebrate villains in the name of what? Heroes. So historians have a big challenge to undo the damage that's done through those kind of things. So in the final analysis, the forgotten talai need to be brought into the open. Not so much to praise them because they are not the only ones who need to be praised. But the reality of it is that their story needs to be told. And when David finishes his book, I'm sure you give me a copy. <laughs> and other people, <laughs> so that um, we get to know. And when you finish with the Talai, I'm sure you find something else to look into, uh, which will be very good. So those would be my general comments. I don't want to go into a lot of details, because uh, David has done a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. One more time, join me in giving a hand of applause to my teacher. Thank you very much. Um, we want to quickly go into a question and answer session. But before we do that, uh, friends, allow me to mention uh, that uh, uh, while we were going on, we were joined by uh, our former peers, Wilfred Kimalat. Uh, who has become very common in these sessions of, of ours. Uh, we, we are happy to have you here. Uh, and uh, of course, online, we were joined by our colleagues from the US. I was able to notice uh, Professor Wanjala Nasongo. And of course, uh, I didn't realize that uh, Nicholas Gituku was online when I was mentioning uh, him here, uh, and uh, I had you mentioning uh, Godfrey Sang. Uh, Godfrey, are you here? Oh, my very good friend and brother. We 
we, we do research together in a number of aspects. Uh, uh, David, the latest one we were talking about women on top. Uh, we, we are working on that paper to have it published uh, with uh, Godfrey Sang. And uh, uh, also I, I, I saw my teacher and your teacher too, uh, Professor John Lonsdale, our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Pius Kakai from KU and uh, uh, Professor Parker Simpson from the US. So there, there are many, but allow me to just make mention of, 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 of that. Now, we will start with uh, on-site, a uh, couple of questions, and then we will go uh, online. Uh, we have the microphones around. Uh, please, uh, let me see by a show of hands. Um, wow, there are many, many hands. So we will start with you, sir. Then uh, we will uh, go to our student, Mokaya. Then uh, our colleague, uh, Kule. And then uh, Dr. Saji, our colleague at the back there, and uh, you, sir, in that order, be precise and to the point, uh, please, because uh, we have so many questions. Yes. Is it working? Uh, thank you very much, David, for a wonderful presentation. My name is Douglas Kirene. I'm right uh, about places of historical interest in Kenya. Um, now, there's been a popular narrative about uh, the Sotik Highlands that uh, they were created as a buffer zone uh, to, uh, you know, to stop the fighting between the Kipsigis, uh, Kisi, Maasai, and uh, the Luo. And um, I just wanted to uh, point out that immediately after the uh, assassination of uh, Coitalios, uh, there was, um, in 1905, the Sotik Highlands was carved out of the Sotik Reserve. So um, this, I don't think uh, Captain Manitz Hagen was absolutely, uh, you know, innocent in what he was doing. And I think the British knew exactly what they were doing. And uh, the, uh, liquidation of uh, Koitale was really meant to uh, further the cause of uh, creating this, uh, uh, the highlands, uh, the reserve uh, for the, uh, the, the British settlers. And uh, uh, immediately after that, um, they did settle in that reserve. So um, I don't think it was uh, entirely innocent uh, what uh, Minitagen did. I think it was something that was uh, not loudly spoken about, but it was well known behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, my friend here. You can go. I think you have a mic next to you. Then we have Mokaya. Uh, okay, thank you. I am uh, John Poit from Kibabi University, and I am biased toward history. Uh, at the present, I'm doing history of uh, colonial chiefs in Nandi, and by by passing, I'm looking at uh, Professor Anderson's work. Now, Prof, uh, I wish to you see, uh, see clearance from you. Was Koitalel uh, cast by his father? Because you remember when Kim Nyolai was in power, and he was uh, killed because of uh, giving wrong information. He warned his sons not to take over power. Now, Prof. Two, I, I don't know. There's a, there are some mistakes. Probably I don't know whether you've captured in your work. We shall discuss maybe for, uh, later on. There, there is some uh, info, some information that. Uh, Jomo Kenyatta was one of the sons of Koitalel. So I do know. <laughs> then lastly, uh, you know, if you look at the Talai clan, they, they normally married very brown ladies. I don't know whether you realize that. Very brown ladies. <laughs> so we shall share a lot. Thank you. Well, 
Uh, Professor Macharia talked about um, claiming legitimacy by association. It's the first time I'm hearing that Kenyatta was uh, the son of Kuitara. <laughs> yes, Alex. Uh, thank you. My name is Alex. And in this department, I'm known as Asian Philanthropy in Medical Services. Now, I have two questions to you, Prof. The first one, based on what you presented this evening, are you then justifying that European imperialism in Africa was a misguided affair? Question two. I, I drive this question from uh, a Twitter handle, one of the politicians of Nandi, in the intending or impending visit of uh, the King of England to Kenya probably next week. And they were asking for the skull or the remains of Koitare uh, of Samui. Now, my question is, what happened to his body when he was killed? Do we expect the remains back? Thank you. Well, that's another one. Yes, uh, David. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Prof. Um, I'm going just straight to this question. I'm just wondering, by 1890s, early 1890s, up to 1905, what would have been the European population in Kenya so that they could be able to do all these kinds of things that they just seem to have been able to do all over the place? And then secondly, you, you, you kept on just using this generic reference to reaction to European presence as resistance, but you didn't get round to pinpointing exactly the nature and character of the resistance. What, for example, was the conflict between the Koitalel and the Europeans in the late 1890s and up to 1905? Was it, was it land? Because we know the railway was not there at that point. So what, what exactly was the beef? Thank you. Thank you. Let's have uh, Dr. Saji uh, from our literature department here in the University of Nairobi. Thank you, Prof, for a very interesting and gripping presentation. Um, I noticed that you are referring to the Libons and the Orkoyots as uh, occult. But people who possess similar powers among the Jews are considered prophets. So I'm worried. I didn't hear you uh, throw in any nuance uh, when you are using those terms. Um, I'm also worried that uh, you are privileging the church. And when you are referring to uh, those who are using uh, indigenous knowledge, which is similar to that which is used in formal churches, uh, you, you, you refer to them, for example, this uh, Sidonic among the, uh, the Kipsigis, you are referring to him as a sorcerer. So you are othering the indigenous uh, knowledges, indigenous practices, and privileging uh, the exotic, the foreign. Um, I just wanted to hear whether you might want to revise your thinking and throw in some nuances. Thank you. Uh, Prof, do you want to respond to those? And then we can go online after this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me take Sinotik the sorcerer first, the last question. I, I sorry, I was quoting the colonial document. I'm not calling him the sorcerer. That's what the colonial policeman called him. So it's colonial language. And I agree with you entirely that that language is designed to exoticize and to other. That's what it's about. So I'm not calling him a sorcerer. I'm merely quoting from the documents. But I do think the point you make about privileging of the church is a very interesting point. And I, I did confess in my presentation that I I don't yet think I feel I fully understand the relationship between Talai and the formal churches. Uh, and I'm not entirely clear on the extent of conversion and the extent of Christian practice among them. So I'm 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 still, I confess, groping around in that one a little bit. I'm not quite sure what exactly I want to say. Because it, it seems to me the pattern isn't really clear. But I also will comment on your, your comment on your very uh, amusing and insightful comments on prophecy and prophets. Um, many years ago, with a colleague, I, I, I edited a book um, which was about prophecy and prophets in East Africa, in which we compared, I think it was 12 or 13 different cases 
of, of, of profits throughout the whole region. And in the introduction to that book, we, we wrote, I think, 10, 12 pages about the importance of understanding prophecy in both the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition. And the way in which ideas about prophets affect our thinking almost without us knowing it, that we inculcate these ideas and attitudes. Uh, but, you know, the truth is that biblical prophets had words put in their mouths as well. <laughs> And that is more or less more or less acknowledged in traditional studies of biblical prophets. And also in the Hebrew texts, Hebrew prophets similarly are recognized as being the mouthpieces for wider issues. And I think that's what the Talai are. You can use stories of prophecy in the Talai to give messages, to give homilies, to talk about life values. And I think if you read David Talai's book on the Kipsigis Talai, he tells many such stories that are actually intended, I think, to teach life lessons to people. They're not intended to be taken literally. <laughs> and I think that's often the mistake made in interpreting these prophecies. They're about how you live your life and how you value your society. And trying to understand that would be would be helpful. Um, if we go back then to the, the first questioner, who asked me about the Sotik expedition, Douglas, thank you very much. Uh, for those who are not aware, what Douglas is referring to is that um, about 18 months, no, yeah, nearly two years after the, yeah, 18 months or so after the killing of Koitalel, the British mounted a major punitive expedition in Sotik. And of all the British acts of violence in the conquest, it was probably the most vicious and certainly had the highest death toll. And it was also difficult to explain because the people in Sotik hadn't done anything. There appeared to be no real cause. And in fact, it's not just Kenyans at the time who assumed this was a kind of land grab. So did London. Because the colonial office wrote to the Kenyan governor complaining that this should not have happened. And then what is not available in the archives here, but is available in the archives in London, is that Winston Churchill got involved. You've probably heard of him. He was a British prime minister. He visited East Africa at this time. And he was frankly appalled by the attitude of settlers to things like the Nandi expedition and the Sotik campaign. He went back to London and told his own government he thought these were nothing but land grabs. And he described the white settlers at the time as, and I quote him directly, a bunch of crooks who were not to be trusted. So even Churchill, and Ch Churchill is a strong imperialist. He believes in imperialism, but he felt that what he saw going on in Kenya in those two years wasn't good. Now, as a result of Churchill's investigations and his protestations, an inquiry was set up in the colonial office that ended up in 1908 with punitive expeditions being banned. So there were one or two smaller ones after Sotik, but after that they stopped. And they were no longer allowed to do these expeditions without first getting clear permission from London. And they could only do them if the full military were involved. So you couldn't do what Hall had done in Fort or others had done and just round up the locals, take a local gang and go and raid someone. And that's more or less what these expeditions often were. So they had to stop doing that. So it's interesting. Sotik is a very good example. And yes, its proximity to the Nandi case is interesting. There is also in the very early settler newspaper that was around at that time, there were lots of debates about the Nandi case. And lots of settlers were quite brazenly writing in the newspaper that the Nandi should be defeated because we want their land. It was being quite explicitly stated. Yeah. And there's actually there's a poem. I, I won't try and recite, I can't remember it all. But there's a little poem in the newspapers making fun of the Nandi because the European, we're going to kill them first, then take their land. So this is this is pretty clear. You're absolutely right. It was it was it, the relationship was there for sure. Yes, I believe it is. I believe it is. So John's question on Kimnoli's death. Um, 
Yes, I think there's there's much more one can say about that. Um, again, we rely on oral histories for the understanding of what happened. And there are several different versions. And wh whether other Okoye were involved in it or not, it depends on who you ask, quite honestly. I did try at one point to understand this from a say looking at oral histories from different mass from different nandi sections did they reveal a different perspective but i'm afraid there wasn't really a clear pattern in what i could find and the, the historian who did most work on this back in the 1970s she didn't deposit the interviews anywhere so we don't we don't know she reports what was said but we can look at the original documentation so we don't so i'm not sure uh Joma Kenyatta has... No. <laughs> don't think so. But but it's a very interesting story, isn't it? Because I think it illustrates the point I made, that this idea of fictive kinship can become a very strong storytelling device. And prophets are very useful for that kind of thing. Um, Koitalel's... Uh, well, no, Talai marriage. Uh, yes, I think Talai marriage is something else that I wish I understood better what happened once they got to Gwasi. Um, so I, I can tell you what the rules were about Talai marriage before then, but I can't tell you what really happened. I'm just not sure. And it's not something that Tui has written much about. So I'm not certain. And, and, and in fact, Godfrey may be the man to ask that question to rather than me. I'm just not certain. And I'd like, I'd like to hear the answer myself. Uh, coming to... Um, European imperialism, a misguided affair. Of course, it was, and I think um, it, it's not. But it's not so much that imperialism itself would be misguided. It's that um, the way in which you carry out these things, it doesn't have to be the way it was. You know, there are there are there are different ways of doing things, and one of the features about Kenya's imperial history, as compared to other places in Africa, is that. Strange things happen in Kenya, like the Sotik expedition that Douglas mentioned, that shouldn't have happened. And I don't think something like Sotik would have happened in Tanzania. I don't think it would have happened in Uganda, but it happened in Kenya. And so one of the questions that Kenyan historians should ask themselves is that comparative one. What was different here? Well, why did these things happen here when they didn't happen somewhere else? And that's that's a question we should always have in our minds, I think. Uh, Koitalel's skull. This story will not die, will it? This story will not die. So the, so as far as I can work out, and I'd be interested if anybody else has got information on this, date me. But the earliest reference to Koitalel's skull I can find is 1996. So before 1996, I can find no reference to Koitalel's skull. But in 1996, it appears in an article about the Nandi in the Daily Nation. And it appears to have just grown from there. Uh, and it's now widely believed, because I've talked to Nandi friends fairly recently, it's widely believed that at the battle I've described, the British ran away with Coitlell's head. Now, this could not have happened. There is no way it happened. And in fact, in the 1990s, I, I used to give a seminar paper in the UK, uh, which I entitled... So who, who, um, what did they do with Coitlell's body? And of course, what, what Nandi say happened is he was, he was carried from Cairn, which would have been what would happen to a leader it wouldn't have be left for the hyenas, but an important person would be buried under a cairn. Uh, now, I then asked people, well, where's the cairn? So, so far, I've been shown six cairns <laughs> that are claimed by different people to be Coitlel's burial place. Who knows? Who knows? But I, I suspect that's what happened to Coitlel. His head is not in London. It's not in the British Museum. It never, nothing of that sort was removed. Uh, but that story will still be around 20 years from now, I guarantee you. We won't kill it. Um, 
European population in Kenya before 1905? It's a good question. I, I see what, exactly what's behind your question. So how can such a small population do all this mayhem? What is happening? Well, the population is very small, very tiny. There are fewer than 200 settlers, um, but they're reinforced by a military that's largely coming from India. So there are, there are Indian soldiers helping them. And they do a lot of what they do. And this is painful for some Kenyans to appreciate. They do a lot of it through local collaboration. So when places are attacked, like Sotik, the Sotik expedition that Douglas referred to, the British again use Maasai auxiliaries in attacking Sotik. So they're using one group to attack another group. Yeah. Yeah. And even in, even in central Kenya, one Kikuyu clan was used to attack another. So, so this is how the sometimes European imperial historians call it a thin, thin red line of imperialism, how it's thickened is by adding local collaborators. Or if you, some people don't like the word collaborator, they prefer to use ally. But whatever word you use, English language is wonderful for that. You can soften the meaning. But whatever word you use, what we mean is there has to be some connection with local peoples. And Moneni earlier mentioned my, my advocacy of studying loyalist history. It's for exactly this reason. You have to understand this or else you miss really important parts of your own history. Yeah. And I'm Scottish. We have a clan history. But some clans fought for the English. And we have to admit that and realize it. Else we don't we don't get our history right. Yeah. Okay. So it's not just you guys. It applies elsewhere too. Um resistance. Yeah, I, I I did use the word resistance a bit too loosely. Thank you for picking me up on it. And I think it's just the feature of giving a talk where you're trying to be, you're trying to generalize a bit. Um I've just got a book coming out called Resistance. Uh, uh, called get me to get it right resistance protest and rebellion in which i look at all three in kenya's history and try and discuss the relationship between them and yes some of these things i would call acts of resistance others are protests others are simple acts of criminality <laughs> done for self-accumulation so there are all kinds of things on this spectrum but they're all actions against the state. They're all subversive. So they're all intended to subvert authority. They have that in common. But some of them harm your own people as well as the enemy. And that's something that's got to be recognized as well. So yes, I think I did I did use that term too loosely, and I should tighten up on that. Um, that's I think that's all the questions, Kenneth. I think I've covered everything. Thank you. Yes, stand there we go on Okay. Um, let's go online now. I can see a number of hands. Uh, let's begin uh, in this order, please. I can see a number of hands. Let's begin in this order. We will start with uh, Professor Susan Muller uh, from, from New York. Prof, uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, yes. David? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Yes, yes, oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Um, um, thanks for your talk. And um, I thought your admonitions about care with which one um, assesses the veracity of archives and other sources was well done um, and timely. My question is, you mentioned, um, you said you, you didn't really know why leaders had joined the church. So I under, I get that, you don't have the specific information, but I'm wondering, this is kind of a general question. Is there any reason or do that the usual reasons for doing so would not be apt such as persuasion, collaboration, safety, upward mobility and education? Um, do we have any information on any of that? I mean, if we just, even if you don't have it specifically, if we look at the people and yeah, the context. Thank you. Uh, let's have uh, Nora Lagat. Uh, Nora, unmute and please proceed. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk, Professor Anderson, and thank you to the team at the University of Nairobi for organizing this. Um, I guess I have a couple of is how you distinguish between the Orkoy that's a lie um, and the 
and the Laibons when you're working in colonial documents because these terms are so conflated. So do you just go by the region of which you are looking at these terms? So if you're working on, say, um, the Kipsigis, then do you automatically assume that those are the Salai? Then my second um, question is uh, to ask whether it would be useful for your book project to think about the changing institution of the Orkwaik so that, um, you know, did it start off as being a, an exclusively religious institution, right? So that their job was to uh, foresee the future and then it becomes complicated uh, when they become seen as potential political leaders. Um, and that might potentially help us to understand the ethical dilemma that they themselves found th themselves in. But thank you so much. Uh, let's have uh, Dr. Eliot Biagon, uh, please, our colleague from uh, Embu University. Uh, Dr. Biagon, please unmute and proceed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, my name is Dr. Eliot Biagon, Kenyatta University, not, not Embu. Uh, so, Prof. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. My question is on a possible theory uh, concerning this borrowing of this Laibon institution from uh, Maasai into the Nandi. So these kind of things can be borrowed, but how do they actually become inculcated and accepted uh, within this group that borrows? Thank you very much. Thank you, Elliot. I always confuse. Forgive me. It's Kenyatta University. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have uh, uh, Dr. Giribat uh, Ara Bor. Uh, Dr. Bor, please unmute yourself and uh, proceed. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity. And thank you, Professor Anderson, for this insightful presentation on the organic of, of the Nandi of the, or Kalenjin. Uh, personally, I'm Nandi. Um, I teach uh, in the School of Business of the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. So I'm, I'm not a historian, but I'm in, an interested party in the history of the Kalenjin and Nandi in particular. Um, Two things I would like to bring forward, uh, maybe as question or suggestion. Um, you talked about uh, Parserian Arab Manye. I, I think I have made a correction uh, in in the chat that it was not Kimanye, but Parserian Arab Manye. Um, we have read about the Nandi protest of 1923, which was said to have been organized by Parserian Arab Manye, and that was the reason why he was um, detained by the British colonialists. And um, we know it as we know him as the longest serving detainee in Kenya's history, I stand to be corrected. But we would like to hear more about the, that protest and why, uh, why it took place. Um, secondly, uh, the history of the Nandi um, resistance against British rule seem not to have received adequate coverage among the latter uh, Kenyan history to the extent that even as King Charles is visiting Kenya, we read in the papers about the Mau Mau rebellion as having been one of the fiercest rebellions in the history of Kenya. But I would want to refer to the to the Nandi resistance from 1890 to 1906 as having been the first and fiercest uh, 
uh, resistance against British rule and would wish to bring forth to the uh, Kenyan historians in this um, in this public lecture, I would challenge them to take it up and bring it forth so that Kenya and the world can really appreciate that fact. Uh, and then lastly, Professor, um, after the encounter between the British and the Nandi in that, in that late part of 80, the 1890s and the 1900s, there was a great deal of rapport afterwards and the British settled around Nandi uh, and the surrounding districts where the Nandi used to graze their animals. And the Nandi worked for the British as um, uh, squad of uh, farmers taking care of their livestock. And there was a lot of uh, uh, marriages of British men to Nandi women. And there is a lot, of, a great deal of progeny coming out of that relations that requires to be um, written about, recited and written about. Uh, I would like to invite you to think about that in your endeavors to, to write history. Uh, thank you very much. Or uh, I think that's an important uh, question you have raised and the prof I will add into that, that every time I go home to the Kisi Highlands, I'm accused of having ignored our history because we also gave a serious resistance. And uh, they are still asking me to look for the head of Otenio. So, so as you answer, uh, Bor, uh, answer that also. Now, let, let's uh, have um, Elliot uh, Tarimoy. Elliot? Uh, please yes, answer. yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Good, uh, good, evening. Ask, good, good uh, evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, let me just make a few comments. I, uh, one, I am uh, uh, a fifth generation Talai. And in the house, there is Kipchoge Chamu. I think he must be listening to, to this. And I really appreciate uh, the presentation by Prof. Anderson, uh, Professor Monene. Uh, I just took note of something I thought I need to mention that as Talai, we would not really be associated with uh, the occult movement thing. Um, the Talai, we, we, we do not practice magic. We do not we don't have witches. We, we do not do those paraphernalia. The only thing that the Talai do is that it is a gift. We do not know how God decided that the Talai would be given this gift, the gift to foretell, to foresee, to prophesy. We have become a reclusive community. I'm speaking from Transoia. I don't live in Nandi, but I'm a Nandi Talai. But we had to leave the lands of Kapsisiwa because of the difficulties, the form of marginalizations that we have. This, the problem with the Kenyan history is, uh, I had somebody make mention that there are records and accounts that have not been taken by even the Kenyan historians. The challenge is our history is more political. If it favors a certain, you know, uh, uh, people, then their history is made loud, and that is why the Mau Mau has been so loud and consistently. Though I don't know whether Professor Munena would agree with me, but then the Talai are a quiet, reclusive community, a community that God has endowed with 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 such wisdom. It's a gift. And that is why all presidents, uh, from uh, the first president of the Republic of Kenya, went to the Talai to ask, is it going to be me? 
President Kibaki, President Moi went. Is it me? Uh, President Kibaki went uh, to Nandi Hills. Is it me? And of course, President Huru Kenyatta and our uh, president, current president, who went uh, very early in the morning to find out the truth about has God said it is me? And in affirmation that a lie, he told him, yes, it is you. I want to say, I do not know much about anything, but I know the history is with us. And Professor Anderson, believe you me, that history is still down here with the descendants of the great Kim Nyoles, uh, Koitalel Samoe, and, and the, the former elders who really went through a very difficult time that today we might not really uh, say that this, the attention has been given to the Talai that live today in Kenya. We, we live everywhere. I went the other day to, to the Baringo, uh, uh, the place called, uh, where is this place? Clo close to Kabarak. And I met some of the Talais who've become- Thank you, summarize who, it, summarize it, sir. Okay, yeah, okay, briefly. Uh, who've become, you know, assimilated into the Tugen. But they are there, they weren't there to hide. I would say there is still a lot of rich history that we can find out. And I would say, Professor Anderson, it would be more, more prudent that you don't only go to the archives, but come down here. We still know something about us. There's some history that was handed down to us and we would be so very willing to share with you. I really truly appreciate your presentation. Today, it's a beautiful attempt to uh, uh, talk about the history of the Talai. Thank very, you very much and uh, I, I appreciate it. I might be on my way there to ask whether it will be me next. Um, uh, let, let, let's, uh, let, let, let's have uh, two prof, and then you can answer. Let's have Professor Nasongo and uh, Dr. Serene, those two, and then uh, uh, Prof. Anderson will respond. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, this is Nasongo. I'm uh, uh, speaking from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I just wanted to add a more question, more question on what has already been asked about uh, this fascination with skulls of uh, killed uh, uh, political leaders on the part of colonialists. Uh, if you could comment, what, what explains the fascination of the British colonialists with chopping off people's heads and taking them away? And I think it was not just the British, but even in Belgian Congo, the colonial officials would uh, conduct expeditions against the law and then chop off heads and have them displayed in their compounds. What, what explains this, this fascination with chopping off people's heads and having them displayed, whether in museums or in compounds of uh, colonial political leaders? Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Professor Nasongo. Uh, let's have Sorone very quickly, please summarize it. Summarize yeah, it. I will. Uh, I will. Thanks a lot, Ken. I mean, and, um, uh, thanks a lot, Ken. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, Doc, we can't hear you. I'm going to switch off my mic. Can you hear me now? I'm off the mic directly. Can you hear me? Uh, still very faint. Uh, uh, perhaps try to adjust and speak closer to your mic. How about now? Can you hear me? Really better. All right, I um, I stopped the Bluetooth. So, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ken and then Professor Anderson for this organization. I'm speaking to you from Germany, very close to Bremen. I am an ethnic Nandi, very proud of ethnic Nandi. I'm not a historian myself. Um, I'm a professor of food biotechnology and a businessman. Um, and that's, you know, basically the end of it. I have a couple of comments and a question. Um, the, I, I start with the, uh, the question. I mean, you mentioned the uh, notorious main attack. I, I like to call him so. Um, if indeed he was a con, I wonder why he died as, a, as an knighted man. He is a CBE and a DSO. Why he was indeed defrocked? If that was indeed 
something that was discovered later that he was a, um, a con artist um, in that case. And, and the, um, the thing on the comment that I wanted to make was, to the best of my knowledge, and I am a descendant of a member of Quetelel's cabinet. So, you know, we have the Oroyot, and below that, there would be what you would call Mao Tiot, or, you know, members of the cabinet. And my great, my grandfather, my mother's uh, father was a member of Quetelel Samoy's uh, cabinet. I didn't leave, or he didn't leave for me to see him. Um, he died uh, probably when my mother was in her infancy. And, and so I do not know whether there was a possibility to have nine or goyots. It's not possible. In my opinion, I think what you refer to, or what is referred to there as nine or goyots, is potentially nine Maori, the, the members of the cabinet that represented regional interests, because the Orgoyot never interacted with people. But he was represented by Mao Tiot from, from every community. And just take note that every Talai is not an Orgoyot. However, every Orgoyot needed to be, must be a Talai. And I see the temptation sometimes to interchangeably use these terms, which I think is um, you know, very tempting. Um, Professor Anderson, you, you made you made some, some two very interesting observations, which are both provocative. They invite some conversation, and I leave it to historians to do it, on whether Parsirian Aramanyi was Koitalel's son, and whether the staff, which are under the care of my, my good friend and the Talai, uh, Francis Arab Talam at Nandi Hills, are actually uh, remnants or were they collected from Quetalim. I think these are provocative enough. I would counsel against a hasty conclusion unless there is incontrovertible evidence to, to, the, you know, to, to, to sort of confirm it. The reason why I do that is because I, I would take it otherwise as a revisionist attempt to weaken um, that institution and, and therefore think it is something we need to really have evidence that is incontrovertible before we can go there. And the last thing, and I love the way you say that you are a Scot yourself, is, you know, in Scotland, you have your traditional attire. I, I'm sure you would have come to this meeting today in your kilt. Um, and, and a Kenyan would look at you and think, what is happening with uh, Professor Anderson? He's wearing a skirt. Um, I wouldn't refer to you when you are clothed in your kilt as having the indignity of wearing a skirt. And so I'd like to invite a bit of care in a choice of words, because I picked out the word that you said, William Ruto, who was my senior at Cups of the Boys, was clothed in an indignity of an animal skin. I wish to make it absolutely clear in no unequivocal terms that wearing an animal skin in my culture is the greatest honor that a man goes through. And, and this is reinforced by the fact that, you know, having been schooled in China for five years, lived in Bavaria for seven years in Germany where men were what we would consider in Kenya to be skirts made of skin, I think it is proper for us to respect everybody's culture and dress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your point is made. Uh, Prof, now you can answer those many questions, please, very quickly. Let me take the, I didn't, I'm afraid the last speaker, I didn't hear everything you said clearly. So can I suggest that you get my email from Kenneth and that you email me with further questions? But I got the last little bit and I, I, I'd like to explain. So I fully accept your correction of my statement on the, the indignity of the skin. And I do, I think your analogy is a very good one. I wouldn't consider a kilt an undignified um, mode of dress. I do own a kilt, but frankly, it's a bit too hot to wear in Kenya. It's very heavy. People don't realize this kilt is very heavy. Um, 
but I think I meant it not so much in the terms that uh, wearing a skin was itself an indignity, but I suspect that perhaps I may be wrong, but I suspect that Mr. Rutu maybe thought it was an indignity. That's my hunch, but I don't know for sure, but I accept your point fully. I also, I would also want to stress that I, in pointing out the problems about the artifacts that were given back to the mausoleum, I in no way intend to denigrate the mausoleum uh, because I know they acted in good faith and everything they've done has been, I think, excellent. And I praise the place very much. But I do think that it's important that we try and understand what happened here. And it's part of the event itself when Koitalel's killing. And I think the context of that killing leads us to realize there were no beheadings. There was no picking over bodies to take things. That's not what happened. And we have lots of descriptions of what happened from people who saw it at first hand. So I think that I don't think this weakens the institution. In fact, I'd wish to strengthen the institution, not weaken it and support it further. I want to see the Muslims' work being expanded, enlarged, and supported very much. So let's move questions as quickly as I can. Uh, Professor Nasongo's question, this is the Brit Okay. Yeah, what, what obsesses the Brits about chopping off heads? Um, it's interesting, isn't it? There, there, there are two, maybe three substantive cases about this where heads were removed. Uh, but many of the other cases that we hear about are actually spurious. There's, there was no removal at all. So this has become a kind of um, imperial myth. And I think it 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 we, it can be amusing. It can be it can be lighthearted, but at its root is a very serious issue. Um, often in war, body parts are removed. Often in war, people are mutilated, and the stories that we receive about heads being removed are relating to that kind of experience. They're relating to a trauma of warfare. And colonial conquest was often traumatic. So just because the stories aren't true, I think that doesn't mean we should ignore them. They're telling us something about how people feel about what happened and how they relate to that story. So I, 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 I don't think the British had an obsession with chopping heads off, but I do think <laughs> that when such things did happen, it's, it's, it's bound to leave its residuals that are not positive at all. Uh, coming to uh, Elliot's questions, uh, uh, fifth, the fifth generation Talai, um, I'm very interested by your responses, Elliot, and I think it's not untypical of, I've talked to many other Talai who also, like you, they don't like the fact that I use the term occult. They're not comfortable with it. And I, I will confess that I have thought quite long and hard about whether I put that in my book title or whether I use that phrase in what I write. And I've decided that I will, because I think that it is occult practice. Um, I, I respect the fact that you no longer think it should be termed that way, but I think historically, not to use that term would be misleading. So I'm afraid we just have to agree to differ. Um, and I do understand fully that the Talai appreciate their, their, their gift of foresight as being the thing that matters. Uh, and I understand that completely. And that is also something I will try and emphasize and try to explain. But I really like the things you said about the marginalization of Talai history. I think that's one of the main points I'm trying to make, that the, the Talai have been marginalized. We have to find a way of changing that and getting them back into the script. And thank you for your invitation. I'll be coming down. You'll see me sometime in the new year. I will contact you and uh, we can see if we can, we can spend some time together and I can meet some other Talai. I would very much enjoy to do that. Um, Gilbert's questions about the 56 protest. Among the migrated archive papers that were deposited in London and released for public viewing about 10 years ago now was a paper on the night, a, a series of papers on the 1956 rising. So we now know more about it. 
But the problem is, Gilbert, that all those sources are colonial. And I've not yet had the opportunity to do any work that would reveal any oral histories about that event. The, the Nandi and Vod were not residents in Nandi district. They were squatters from Lycipia. Um, it's proved very hard for me to trace them. I, I frankly have, am at a loss to know quite how to do it. So I urge someone here, a local historian, take up this challenge. Here's a story that deserves its research. That 56 rising is not well understood. It's not been well documented. If somebody local has the energy and time to try and trace, trace the families of these people, that would be a very, very interesting story to tell. And I will very happily copy the colonial archives for them and share those. I'll send them to anyone who wants them. But the colonial story on that is only one side. And I don't think that story can be told unless the other side is revealed also. Um, marriages between Nandi squatters and Europeans, yes, there were many. Many. And Kipsigis also, to be honest, Kipsigis quite a lot. Uh, I, I, I know families uh, who are the progeny of those marriages. So, yes, you're quite right. And it's something that is not spoken about, is not acknowledged, but it is there for sure, for sure. Um, Eluid asked um, how some of these things become accepted. How do we how do we accept them? Well, I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer, Eluid, and I, I don't think you're really expecting me to be able to answer it. Um, I think it's a tough one. And I think that's something in the book I'm going to have to try and discuss and try and try and maybe work around, but I don't have a clear answer. Uh, Nora asked me about how we distinguish between Talai and Libon um, in the literature, because you're quite right, Nora, in your comment that European observers often muddled things. So I tend to be very cautious in how I use those sources. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you can locate the people quite well, and you usually can work out who they are. So you have some sense. And your point about the changing institutions of the Okoyek, that's a great point. And I think I need to give that more thought. My, my understanding is, is partly that um, at the time that Talai are joined by Loibanok from the 1850s through to the 1870s, there's already, so there's already a Talai clan in Nandi. Yeah, it's there already. And it's already got occult practices of its own. And what happens is the, the Loibon who come in join this clan because it's the most appropriate clan for them to join. And then through a process that I'm not so clear on, the two things merge. So within Talai, you begin to get practitioners of foresight and see them that maybe weren't there before to the same extent. So it changes the nature of Talai. But how that process happens, we're really not certain. We can't be sure. So in the book, again, I'll have to discuss that, but I can't, I can't make big statements about it. But I think, Nora, you're absolutely right. It's about the changing institution of the Okoyik. And I, yes, I do think I agree with you. It throws up some ethical dilemmas for sure. Uh, and then coming lastly to Susan's question, um, thank you for your comment on my treatment of the sources. I, I try very hard in this project to make sure that I don't separate the oral indigenous history from the documentary colonial history, but try and get the two to interrogate each other so that you're not relying on one over the other. Yeah, but sometimes that's hard. Because in some parts of the story, you only have one side. And then it's it's difficult to know how to balance it. So I think in this project, there are maybe some, some methodological challenges as well uh, that I hope people will be interested in when I, when I finish writing it. Because it's not always easy to deal with this. But I've tried to balance where I can. In all the work I've done all my career, I think I've, I've always tried to use both sources. And the colonial source above other things and um, it gets hard to take that position when you have so much data you can sometimes feel you have to use it all but you have to be very careful how you use it
And your comment, Susan, on, on why people join the church is, yes, the list that you gave, yes, of course, I, I'm aware that's the list of possibilities. But I suppose my, my point is I'm not quite sure what to do with that list. I'm not quite sure which of those motivations are there. I think the last one you mentioned, education, that is the one I see as being most clearly the driver. Because in the 60s, when the um, till I come back to Caricho, one of their main concerns is education for children. Because they realize the children are, are losing out. And I think that could well be why some families very quickly get linked into the churches is to get kids into schools in the area. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just hang on uh, there, uh, Prof. I, I'll read for you some of the questions on the chat okay. very quickly. A number of them are just a repetition of what we have already uh, uh, talked about. And re re let me read just a few. Uh, here is uh, Professor John Lonsdale is saying this. Historians of the Talai might like to consider this further uh possible demonstration of their power. Uh, John Deveril's death in the helicopter crash on the mall of, wow, that's a difficult one to read, mall of uh, Kaitai. Kintai. Yeah, that one. That killed a dozen British special branch and intelligence officer during the Northern Ireland troubles. John Deveril's father, uh, Colville Deveril, had been responsible for organizing the Talai deportation to us. Uh, John D. organized their homecoming in 1960. Did he pay for the sins of his father? Yeah. Uh, think about that. Let me read uh, Simpton's uh, comment. I, I thought it was also uh, 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 different from all the others that are similar to what we are. Uh, go to Professor Simpton's comment, please. Uh, there's something here by Lonsdale, uh, just uh, slightly. Uh, he's saying, uh, I met uh, Maynard Stagen uh, in his London flat in 1960, yeah. and he was uh, an uncle of a student friend of mine. He offered me a choice of homemade cocktails, one he calls Sattler and the other Mau Mau. They don't mix. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to Professor Simpson's uh, uh, comment, please. Uh, I, I think it was somewhere up. Uh, it was somewhere up. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it it was probably can different. You hear? Oh, thank you. Can you can you hear me? What? <laughs> okay, what? my comment has to do with the. Uh, my uh, comment has. You have uh, uh, lost that, uh, uh, Prof. Simpson. If you can quickly ask your question, I can't trace it here. I saw it earlier. Yes. Oh, thank yeah, you. Please unmute um, yourself but, and uh, ask. Yes, uh, Parker Shifton uh, speaking. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I, I uh, wish to uh, ask whether there might be parallels to be found within East Africa um, and since independence, parallels to some of the story we've heard here so intriguingly, um, such a fascinating story. Um, the episode of the Talai um, displacement, the forced displacement, uh, the, the move to Gwasi, the return to home, of the attempts to return home, um, may have a parallel in, uh, for instance, um, Uganda. The Acholi people forced into basically concentration camps um, uh, for a, a period of their recent history and then released, um, uh, attempting to return home and finding it difficult to gain reacceptance and to re, uh, and to uh, gain return of of land that they had um, let uh, that they had had to leave, um, so uh, a forced displacement, um, a a confinement, um, a return, and a difficulty of um, re-entering their home communities and regaining land. Um, is this a perhaps a predictable pattern? <laughs> we'll do those two very quickly okay, and we keep thank bring you. this to a close. Uh, I, the settler and Mau Mau don't mix joke. In UK, no one would laugh. <laughs> but here, it's a good joke. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, John Lonsdale's comment on Devereux's death. So this is this is exactly how to lie prophecy can work. Yeah. So if you read David Tui's book, it's full of stories that are constructed from external events, such as the death of a protagonist, that attribute explanation to that death that is occult. He got that because we made him die. And this is what, when people in Kipsigi talk about evil eye, this is what they mean. The, 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 the Okoye can kill you by looking at you. Because he can see you. And he doesn't have to be near you to see you. You could be miles away. He can see you. So Devril died on the hill in the Mull of Kintyre because the Okoye could see him. Yeah, so this is, this is the power of prophecy. This is putting words in the prophet's mouth. Yeah. That's a very good example. Um, Parker Shipton, thank you so much for your comment. I think the Acholi example is an excellent one. I hadn't thought of it. But of course, for Kenyan audience, there's one much nearer home, isn't there? There's a return of Mamau detainees from the camps into their homes. And also the fact Absolutely that... Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely many were never allowed right. to return. Yes, and were instead settled in different places. And some would argue they were more fairly treated than the Talai, because in their return, they were given land. They were given settlements on schemes. The Talai never had such benefits as that. So I think you're quite right, Parker. There are parallels to think about. Uh, as, as ever, I think parallels emerge in historical stories. And those parallels are, I, I think, in, in and enrich the story itself. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. And I think that further, as we look at the newspapers today, we might even find further parallels uh, yes. of displaced people. Yeah, uh, let, yeah. Let, let's have uh, P.S. Kimala, uh, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Anderson. Let me tell you, this is a very thrilling lecture. One of the things which uh, I was slightly late I don't know whether you really, you need to capture the Maasai Nandi or Kalenjin nexus, the relationship. I try. I try. Yeah. Number two, the Talai is not in Maasai no. language. No. And Talai, before even these other, the, the Orkoi, the, before the Maasai who were naturalized socialized to be Nandi, circumcised to be Nandi, trained to be Nandi, we had, they had a clan called Talai. And Talai had a totem is a lion. Yeah. And it looks like the elders agree that since these are supposed to be seers, they, they mm -hmm. therefore should belong to, and, they, and their totem is lion, the Maasai totem is lion. Therefore, it, they fitted in into the Nandi superstructure. Yeah. Then, by uh, then, there is something which I need, which I think you should address. The Libons themselves had Maotic, their the cabinet, yeah. which uh, I think that, that gentleman from Germany mentioned. Yeah. And and if you go to uh, you saw Nandi Hills, there are twenty six of them who were killed along with the Libon. And that concept of the Libon staying indoors most of the time and moving yeah. out, it was the Maotic. Yeah. And that, who that, were, that, hold on, who yeah. were supposed to be giving them information to the extent that I remember I come from one of the clans of those Maotic uh, when we were with uh, Koitaba, who is a Libon, who is mentioned by Tue also. You used to tell me, look, you are my mouth, so yeah. uh, I need to get information. I want to go and relax. So you need to bring that concept of the abode of uh, the tendency of the mouth to stay indoors mm. most of the time. And therefore, the prophecies, something that thrilled me today, the prophecies attributed to mouth could be an element of what Professor. And then it says, said here, you attribute good things yeah. to your leader. Of course, we write speeches. I've been here, so I've been writing speeches, all the things. And then everybody class for the president. And then I say, look, what about me? Yeah. So there is that uh, tendency in history 
to attribute everything to the king, to the king, and not the the the, the, the bureaucracy, which is yeah. the, the the civil servants and all the rest. So I like you to bring the concept, the role of the Maotic in the in the publication or at what yeah. advancement of the Maotio of the work you are sorry. So I, I, otherwise, it's, it's a very amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those comments. I, I actually do have a section on Mautic, and I was going to say it, but I, I felt I was going into too much detail. But that photograph I show of Kipeles and his and his followers, that's the Mautic. That photograph was taken of, uh, that's the Mautic, but with Kipeles. And and Hollis describes in his, in his notes, yeah. he had trouble getting them all to come for the photograph. They didn't want to come. So you got them all there together, but that's that's exactly what it is, and you're quite right. And that's the Maasai tradition being brought into Nandi. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. And it was very important because also Kip Chomba had this group around him. And the same with Sidonik. And the and the and the fact that the big eight is actually it's Sidonik's mountain. It's 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 his group around him, it's his advisors. But the police officers, European police officers don't understand this. They think they're all they're all separate or quite they're not. Make sure that the, the, the Maotic are not No, exactly, exactly. Exactly. That distinction must be brought out. Yeah. And also integrated with it. Yeah. I'll do my best, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, friends, you can agree with me that this is uh, Nice, interesting, and getting fascinating. And we can go on for, for uh, I, I can see my friend Sang saying he wants to say, in Kenya, we call it a burning one. Um, yes, uh, just give him a microphone very quickly, please. And uh, you have a couple of seconds to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, thank, thank you very you much, Professor uh, uh, Anderson, for this uh, beautiful presentation. Um, well, when Lonsdale makes uh, the assertion that Deverell's death was as, as a result of his role in, um, in in the deportation of the Talai, um, there's another fact that is also not. Uh, very far from that, that is the death of Kenya's very first governor, that is the uh, under, I mean, uh, Stuart, um, Donald Stewart, Sir Donald Stewart in 1905. Yes, and uh, he's buried actually at this uh, Makaburini, at uh, this, this place on Bunyala Road. Yeah. Uh, I think that was Kenya's very first uh, state funeral, if you if you were to put it that way. In April, uh, 20th of April, 1905, Donald Stewart traveled to Nandi and went and gave a warning to the Nandi that any further uh, skirmishes will be met with the full force of the law. And when he came back, he was involved in a riding incident and his, he fell off his horse, became sick and died on the 1st of October, 1905, immediately. Um, his death was attributed to the fact that he had uh, tried to challenge Koitalel, who was still alive then. Uh, only that uh, Koitalel was uh, to die 18 days later on the 19th of March, uh, 1905. Of course, this is because of uh, the order that came from uh, Buckingham Palace, yeah. no less from this particular king's great-grandfather, uh, Edward VII and which is the reason why today is very, very important that we are discussing these things at the light of the impending visit, uh, royal visit by these people. I had suggested to some individuals at the British High Commission that it would have been really good if the king had uh, met these individuals for closure, particularly the descendants of the or, or Goik, uh, the, the Talai descendants uh, in Nandi, and one fact was because in 1948, at the birth of uh, this particular king, 75 years ago in November, the, there was a football match to celebrate his birth in Kapsabit. And, uh, and the Nandis defeated the British. It was the Nandi of the British. 
three goals to two. Uh, it would have been a good idea if he actually did not uh, take his time to visit the Kenya Society for the Protection and Care of Animals, but instead take, not, not that animals are any less important, but uh, he would have used that time to even thank these people who defeated the British in a football match, even if they did not defeat them in a, in a field of war. I uh, have also emailed you some details that uh, indicate that uh, indeed Barsiriana Rap Manye was the third son of Koitale, uh, and there's evidence to it. I will invite you to the National Archives where the family tree was prepared by Charles Tompkinson in 1930, who was the yes. district commissioner in Yusindara. Yes. Huh? So indeed, yes, uh, it's not apocryphal that he was a son. So with those so many comments and uh, and that, thank you once again for the wonderful lecture. Thank you so much for the comment, Dr. I really do appreciate it. And I shall pay close attention to the things you've sent me. Um, had, I, had I been playing in that football match, the British would have won. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have discussed that match with uh, Sam. Uh, there's a night we didn't sleep. Uh, on, on WhatsApp, uh, discussing quite a lot of things about what he's saying, the football march and the, the need for the king to visit. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, we, we, we leave it there. Uh, I will not close this uh, without mentioning uh, my very good friend, uh, Miki Mwansia Costa, who joined us uh, 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 this afternoon. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, I will now invite uh, Dr. Gona to finish up this for us. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, on, on behalf of my chair and uh, on behalf of those who are uh, present and those who are online, uh, I'd like to really extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude for gracing this uh, uh, public uh, uh, seminar series. Um, we've had a long uh, engagement with David, uh, maybe of all these uh, students around, maybe Wahome and Margaret. Uh, I, I know David in the mid-90s uh, as a, a junior member of staff, and he's very encouraging to push me along the academic line. And uh, today I told him that uh, sometime we hadn't interacted, and I was really touched that uh, he honored our invitation to speak to us. So David, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the chair, half of the colleagues and everybody here, thank you again. Thank you very much for uh, gracing us. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>